are coming out of a really pretty ugly night. A couple things. Um, let's hope the ugliness stopped at the door. A um, <laughs> couple things we want to uh, want to talk about tonight before we get started with our presentation. First of all, that uh, the Mid Atlantic Reformation Society is active with the uh, Burke's Patriots. We have a uh, book table there. If you ever want to come out, come up and see us. We are trying to influence those folks, trying to let them know that uh, apart from Jesus Christ, there, there's not liberty of anything. There, ju there just flat out isn't. There might be for a short while, but somebody gets a hold of things. Without the fear of the Lord, you don't even have the beginning of wisdom or knowledge. It's just that simple. Um, also, I um, want to let you know, some of you are aware of this, we have started another Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society meeting place up in... Um, up in Mahoning Valley, um, if you go north on the Northeast Extension, you go through the tunnel, the first exit there. And so we're, uh, we're, we're branching out there as well. And again, um, one of the reasons why we started the Middle Atlantic Reformation Society, actually, I, really probably the biggest reason, all the board members are here tonight except for John. And our, our thinking was, um, well, we think a lot of things. We thought we wanted to get help pastors. Um, that, that hasn't worked so much uh, as well. But we wanted to address these topics that we felt were not being addressed in church, in churches, that the Bible actually talks about. So we've addressed things like criminal justice, economics, uh, sound money, um, the long haul, you know, thinking, thinking generationally. Have you ever thought how much uh, the, Bible, the Bible thinks generationally? We live in a time when um, most of North American Christianity just can't wait for the rapture. And... Um, you know, better, better folks than us have lived, have lived through uh, worse than what we're, what we're dealing with. So we ought to really make sure that we have our theology down and understand uh, what the Bible has to say because uh, we're supposed to occupy, we're supposed to work <clears throat> instead of wait. But that seems to be the paradigm nowadays. Not work, wait. <coughs> Rapture's coming any day now. Just have a dodge. Um, so we, so, so that's that's part of what generated the idea of the Middle Atlantic Reformation Society. Want to briefly, like like Toby said, uh, address a couple of books. Uh, this uh, this Christmas, I I, um, I opened up by uh, a gift that one of my sons gave me, and it was this, the Action Bible. And I was like, <sighs> I, I really thought I was a better father than that. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I, I thought I was getting something like, you know, like, like the teen study Bible or right. you know, one, one of those things. It's like, oh wow. But then I, then I popped it open and it's a, it's a man who I believe loves Christ and, ha, and has taken a bunch of, the, a lot of the Bible stories and put them in, in comic book form. Now, I don't know about you, but I am a, I am a comic book guy. I think, I think comics are one of those powerful methods of communication if, if, done, the, if done the right way. What I wanted to look at right away, though, was a lot of times people write this kind of stuff and they stay away from the controversial stuff. And instead of this, the controversial stuff, we get you know, pictures of Jesus you know, playing Ring Around the Rosie with the children or something. Um, I hate to be that explicit, but you know, it's like the nice, the nice Jesus. And uh, he doesn't do that. I mean, he, he, I, I, dis I disagree with him on some points. But, for example, he just doesn't stay away from Balaam's donkey talking. You know, it's, he's got, you know how the comics work, he's got the bubble, right, above the donkey, and, <laughs> and Balaam's donkey's talking. So that tells me he's not afraid. And I've, I've read about halfway through, and again, he's not exactly where I, where I would be. But uh, I had a chance to, uh, my, my grandchildren are really young, and they really can't understand, but I got a chance to sit down with them and just kind of flip through it. And it's extremely extremely attractive to them. So I, I, I hope you get a chance to look at, at this particular book. Also, this book here, The American Indian, I just want to briefly, Toby, thanks for, for, for getting this by, by Mark Rushdooney. This is um, recollections of his father. Um, R.J. Rushdooney has influenced me a lot. May, a, a, a lot because he predicted the problems that we have now. You know, back in the early 60s, he was talking about the United Nations and what a disaster it was. Well, back in the early 60s, everybody was happy with the United Nations. After all, it created the state of Israel. Well, what do you want, right? And he's also complaining about public education. And his point was that any organization or anything that is not explicitly Christian will one day be explicitly anti-Christian. And for R.J. Rushdoony, 
all of life was either based on the word of God or the word of man. No, no third option. No, no, no. That's it. Word of God, word of man. That's it. And so he wrote on aspects of God's law and society. And um, a lot of people react, re react to him. I wish, I wish more would interact with him. That's, 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 what, I, that's what I wish. Um, a, lot, a lot of folks are dismissive. But this book here, if you've ever wondered about the whole Indian issue, which I have done. When I was a teenager, I was like 16 or 17, mm -hmm. I, I read Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Some of you may be familiar with that book by D. Brown. I always wondered about what, 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 what were we supposed to do? What was supposed to happen? And one of the reasons why R.J. Rushdooney became the thinker that he did was because he went out on the Shoshone Indian, uh, Indian Reservation and he worked with them. And he, and, he, and he came face to face with a problem, and that was this. Let's see, the United States government, and I, I've worked on an Indian reservation in um, uh, Crow Indians, in, well, there were some Crow Indians in Minnesota when I was, went to college out there. And um, anybody here ever work on an Indian reservation? I'll tell you what, it, it, it's an eye opener. Government pays 100% for the dental bill. Guess who doesn't have any teeth? It's a fact. Government pays for everything. They don't work. They're drunk. They die young. I'm not. I'm not talking out of school here. This is the way it is. And he saw that happening on on, on the Shoshone Reservation. He said, that, well, "We're taking care of everything. Why is it such a disaster?" This book answers it. Um, and and you know one of the things that is not well known was that uh, Sitting Bull was actually killed by. And I'll just just briefly talk about this, and then we'll get started. Sitting Bull was actually killed by other Indians. And one of the reasons why they thought he was a lazy bum. And there was a division that we never hear about between the Indians, some that wanted to work and integrate into American society, and some that just wanted to hang on the reservation forever and not do anything. And there was a division between the two. And um, if, if, this, if that topic interests you, this is by far the best book I've ever read on the subject. And I've, I've, read, a, I've read a few on the subject. Not a whole lot, but a few. All right. Tonight our topic, work or war. Have you ever thought of that? <coughs> Isn't there a third way? I, I, my, my premise tonight is there's no third way. You're either going to be a worker or you're going to be a warrior trying to steal your neighbor's goods that your neighbor worked for. That's it. No third way. Okay, that's a lot to prove, a lot to try to demonstrate. Let's hope we'll be able to get it done. First of all, let's begin by asking the following questions. Is work necessary? If yes, then work is not optional. Right? Something's necessary is definitely not optional. Do we live in a society that thinks work's optional today? Yeah, you bet we do. Is work profitable? If yes, then why not participate in it? It should be profitable. Now that's what's under attack today, is it not? The profitability of work is under attack. Thirdly, is work commanded? If yes, then it's sinful to refrain from work, if it's commanded. Finally, is any good thing possible without work? Anything at all? Let's define it. Work is that activity that glorifies God and benefits our neighbor. Now, a lot of times we don't have a theology of work because I think we live in a time, again, and we always encourage questions after the lecture, but I think we live in a time when we're, 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 we're all about our relationship with God. Good. Good. But how do we actually love our neighbor? All throughout the scriptures, loving your neighbor and loving God are definitely intertwined. One of the things that makes Christianity what it is is because it does intertwine the two. Think of Hinduism, Buddhism, for example. What is, what is considered spiritual and good in Hinduism, Buddhism? It's, it's sitting back in Hinduism, gazing at your belly button, and, 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 and contemplating divine things. Wonderful things, the meaning of life, etc. Well, what does that do for your neighbor? Absolutely nothing. Work benefits your neighbor and glorifies God. Now, um, it may or may not be physical in nature. Um, 
let's look. It was the first command ever given. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Genesis 2.15. So God gave uh, um, Adam work in the beginning. Gave him work before the fall. It's a mistaken idea that, oh, now, you know, you, you, you fell there in Genesis 3. Now you're going to have to work. Not true. He had worked prior to that, did he not? It just became harder for what he had done. But let's think about this for a minute. Now, there are some folks that believe that there's um, work only, you have physical labor, you know, with your hands. Other people are like, no, the real work is uh, what you got to do with your head, the neck up, which is, can be pretty hard. But, you know, Adam had both, didn't he? God sanctified both methods of work in the very beginning. He gave him the garden to tend and keep with his hands, right? But he gave him something else to use his head on. Remember what it was? Name the animals. He had to name the animals, didn't he? And from what I understand, that word means classify. He, it, it, it meant more than, you know, the very uncreative uh, insect that we've called a fly because it flies. <laughs> That's a pretty creative name. Um, no, he, uh, he had to come up with a whole lot more than that. He had to work with his head. And he had to work with his hands. At that point, God uh, qualifies and approves of both kinds of work. Now, I want to talk about a little bit before we go any further tonight, because um, uh, well, we have a union problem in this country. And I've talked to some union guys in my life. And everyone that I've ever talked to is basically like, you know what, we're the ones doing all the work. And the guys, the guys sitting there in the office, they don't do any work. And I want to tell a quick story. I won't tell the whole thing because I mentioned before, here before at the, at the Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society. But one day, um, we had a young man come over to our house. And he was, um, uh, he was attending a uh, local community college, I believe. Right, Luke Grant? Yeah. Community college. At that time, he, had a, he was laid off from his job as a as a stock guy in a, in a warehouse. And we got to talking. First thing we started talking about was public education. And then after that, we got on to um, some other things. And I made the statement, I said, Karl Marx never, ever cared about workers. In fact, he hated peasants. And I've seen those quotes where Marx said, he can't teach those dumb people anything. It's so pathetic. He did not want to hang out with the peasants, Mr. Champion of the Peasants, Karl Marx. And then this young man said, ah, Karl Marx what, didn't, didn't hate peasants, he just hated business owners. I was like, well, them too. Uh, he kind of hated pretty much everybody. Hated two of his kids, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Champion of the People. Two of his kids died of neglect. Died under his roof of neglect. Mr. Champion of the People impregnated his house servant. Her name was Lynchin. Never acknowledged the baby at all. Never, never paid a dime, Mr. Mr. The People's guy. Well, in any case, with this young man, as we as we were discussing this, he said, you know, um, Karl Marx understood that uh, business owners don't work. And of course, I'm thinking, you know what's disgusting about this conversation? that this kid's paying for this education. You know what's even worse? <clears throat> so am I, with my tax dollars. So I was like, okay, this, this thing is going south awful fast. So I said, well, what do you mean they don't work? He said, no, nah. he said, they just, they just sit around. They, they don't do anything, they don't have to think of anything. I said, look, I said, um, I don't know any business owner that doesn't work 12 hours a day. I mean, they might take vacation or something. But in terms of working their business, Every business owner I've ever known works a good 11, 12 hours a day. It's, it's no eight-hour thing. Punch out and go home. He said, nah. He said, they don't do any work. I said, uh, this is amazing. This is amazing. He goes, um, or I said, uh, so you think you run a, big, a, a large business? Never even hesitated. Hmm, yeah, I think I could. You see, see here's a guy who, who thinks... That you only work with your, with your, you know, the guy running the rider jack, the forklift is actually doing any work. Um, a guy like that would last an afternoon in a real, in a real business. But let's go back the other way. 
And we'll talk a little bit later about the Greeks and the Romans, who thought the only type of work that was legitimate for freemen was with your head. So we have this um, diver diversion, if you will, between the two. There's been some times in history when only the real good people work with their, with their head, and another time, only the real good people work with their hands. That's pretty much Marxism. Um, you may or may, not, may or may not remember Pol Pot. And you may or may not remember, they, took people, they ran people right out of the hospitals and put them out in the fields because Pol Pot had been a, a fan of the French socialists. And for them, the only kind of work was working with your hands, working, working the ground, you know, the land, working the land. And um, what, a, what a complete disaster. French Revolution, the same thing. French Revolution, the only kind of work that was legit was with your hands. And if you had glasses, good chance you get your head cut off just for having glasses because you obviously don't work with your hands. So this, this problem of work is not something that everybody agrees on. And, and I'm arguing tonight that only in the Christian context can work be understood as we, uh, as, as we move on. Finally, it is the outworking of the Dominion Mandate. Now, uh, I... Just, just to briefly talk about that, very, very briefly. Um, what, why is the Dominion Mandate so ignored? Y you know, early on, God says why we're here. Now, we've all heard the questions. Why am I here? What am I doing here? We've all heard that kind of thing. Why do we never go back <coughs> to Genesis chapter 1? Where God says, Let, "Let's make man in our image. Let him give. Let's give him dominion over the works of, of, of our hands here." We have a statement about why we're here, right there, and it's one we ignore. And I'm not sure why, but the dominion mandate, working with your hands and with your head, is an absolute outworking of the dominion mandate, as we see in Genesis 2. When we approach this topic, we generally think of, of work as two things: one necessary and two evil. Why else would we call it a necessary evil? <clears throat> Consider this. Work was commanded prior to the fall. When nature came into existence, so did work. Does God work? Sure does. <coughs> they even rested from it. You see, when nature came into, in, into existence, at that point, God begins to work. He worked creating nature, and we work maintaining nature. Also, let's remember this. The opposite of work is not play, and it is not rest. The opposite of work is idleness. Little boys. What do little boys play with? <coughs> they, they play with work things, don't they? I had... How many, of you, how many of you are old enough to remember Town Toy in Pottstown? Oh man, it's huge. Remember that? A oh, big store. It was like dying and going to kid heaven. There were just toys everywhere. And where did me and my brothers always go? We were always going to the track, the metal track, you know, the, the, I guess they're plastic now, Tonka, whatever. That's what we did. Girls, what do they often play with? Dolls, you know, doing, doing work. How do we know this? Proverbs is all about wisdom and work. Now again, let's talk about the Christian ethic here for a minute. Did you ever think about the fact that, that it's only in the Christian ethic that work and wisdom are tied together? See, normally I think of wisdom as, again, sitting back and contemplating the meaning of life and coming up with wonderful answers that everybody is impressed with. I remember... Um, what a disaster that is, if you don't want to do any work. I still remember uh, Peter Jenkins. Um, years ago, he wrote a book called Walk Across America. Uh, some of you may have seen it. And he, um, on his walk across America, he started up in New England, went down through Tennessee, went down through Texas, and then wound up finally in, in California. And uh, one of the things that he, he mentioned was he stopped off, and this would have been in the 70s, he stopped off at a hip, hippie commune. And he said he remembers one day they were talking about it, and, and, and the, the guru guy was talking. And somebody said, well, what about, what about God? Does he exist? And the guy said, well, 
this is this is the Google guy. He said, well, um, if God is, then he is. And if God isn't, then he isn't. That was pretty much the end of that discussion. You know, if that was the wisdom, I'd hate to hear the nonsense. I'd hate to hear the foolishness. Wow. Now, look at what look at what Proverbs says. We know Proverbs is a book about wisdom. It's a book about wisdom versus foolishness. For example, the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31 does not eat the bread of idleness. This is only the second time in this chapter that tells us what she does not do. See, when we look at the virtuous woman there in, in Proverbs, which we're going to look at right now, I, I want you to listen to what she does because her, her wisdom is not identified as being smarter than everybody else. It's identified in what she does. Because, my friends, what we do is what we're measured by in terms of loving our neighbor. Remember, um, remember the Good Samaritan? You know, two guys kind of walk by, and I, you know, I, I, I still believe this to this day, is the priest and Levi Levi probably felt bad. You know, that's our, our idea of loving, right? How do you feel? I, I feel? I feel bad. I feel bad about this. You know what? You ever notice? We, we, we have no idea how the Samaritan actually felt, do we? I have no idea. Doesn't tell us. What tells us is that he acted. He did something about it. Listen to this, this woman. Who can find a virtuous woman or a virtuous wife? So you think now, okay, virtuous wife, she, I don't know, reads books, I don't know, uh, can hand out words of wisdom. I, let, let, let's, let's listen to the virtue here. Let's listen to it. Her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her. Already we're talking about what she does. So that there is no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. Virtuous woman is one who can work with her hands. You ever thought of that? When you think of virtue, you think of working and doing good things. <coughs> or is our ideas more Hinduish? Hey, you know, it's what you think. It's that too, but it doesn't stop there. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises wild as yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her hand or her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands holds the spindle. Now listen to this. She extends her hand to the poor Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. All right, let's uh, talk about this for just a second. Let's ask ourselves this question. What, um, what societal context does profitable work origin originate? What's the societal context? We have, for example, local cities getting involved in the parking garage business. Is that, is, is, that, is, that, is that where we, we see profitable work? The beneficiaries of her work, the object of her work, and the encouragement to work even more. Let's see. The societal context in which profitable work originates is the family. It's not the state, and it's not the church. You know why? Because the state and the church don't risk. They don't put anything at risk. The state is owed money, taxes. We've talked about that before. They're not, they're not allowed to collect them by force, though, according to God's law. Taxes, according to God's law, are voluntary. We see no place under God's law where anyone is allowed to put a gun in somebody's face and say, pay me money because I'm the state. No, no place. We do see forcible taxes in the Bible, but it's with Artaxerxes, for example, and it's with not a real great guy, to use, for example, King Saul. We can talk about that more if, you, if you'd like. 
No, the societal context in which profit work originates is the family. They're the ones that risk. And so they're the ones, the family out of the three institutions is the one that deserves the profits from the work because they took the risk. Think about it. Do you think you'd ever produce a product that people want if you never take a risk to do it? If you always stayed safe the whole time? We just read, she sees that her hands is, is, is good work. Why? Because people want it. Profitable work originates with the family. Secondly, the beneficiaries of her work. First of all, family members. First of all. We don't live in that kind of context today. The state's deep into your paycheck before you can ever spend it on your family. Not godly. The beneficiaries of, of her work is her family. But do you see what happens, though? Because she, she is so productive, and her family's so productive, now she has enough left over to give to the poor. And that's the way it has to work, right? You give to the poor out of what you have left over. The result of her work is praise. I know we're supposed to only praise God, but listen to this. L listen. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm and deceitful, charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Second time. Give her the fruit of her hands. Let her own works praise her in the gates. You know, people who are working hard, they should be praised and not vilified. It's what we do. Oh, he doesn't deserve all that money. Oh, that's, that's enough money. Let's take some away from him. No, you should be thanking, thankful that there's somebody else out there working so you can have a job. You, you shiftless politician. You'd be scared stiff to go out and do half the work that people who are supporting them do. The encouragement to work even more. Give her the fruit of her hands. She worked. She gets the reward. I know everybody hates. Is it the what's what's the the, 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 little, the little red hen story? But it's exactly right. Remember the little red hen? I'm gonna plant some gonna plant some wheat. Who's gonna help me? I think it was not I said to help me out. It was the goose, the pig. Of course, there's always a pig. <laughs> and I think something else. I forget what it was. Was it a dog? Dog and cat. Dog and cat. <laughs> yeah, I really like the pig. But you, you recall. So she does it herself. And then she says, well, who's going to help me harvest? Nobody. Who's going to help me bake? Nobody. Who's going to help me eat? Everybody. And if you, if you ever read the original one, and I think, I think it's very clever. Well, not clever. I think it's very accurate. But the one, the one that I read recently said, and she, she shut the door on all these other animals that didn't feel like working. And then it says this, and she gave bread to herself and her family. It's one of the reasons why we can't mess with these good fables that we have. Hollywood wants to ruin everything, including our decent fables and our, our decent fairy tales to actually teach us something. There is a, uh, there is an alternative to that story, that little fable. Have you ever seen it? Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll ruin it. But the, but the, the, the alternative is that um, she got a knock on her door shortly thereafter, and it was the state who was accusing her of hoarding. Look at all these other hungry animals. You have all this bread. So she um, was made to hand it out to everybody else. She, her own family went destitute. All the other animals moved into her house, ruined it in about six months, and no one ever heard of any of them again. All right. Give her, give her the fruit of her hands. Why? Then we want to get through this. Why do we say work or war? Proverbs does indeed end by showing us what work does. Proverbs begins in 1.10 by showing us the only alternative to work, war against our neighbor. In this passage, which I'll read in a minute, nearly all of society's darker vices are displayed. 
Lying, deceiving, covetousness, stealing, murder, greed, laziness, and socialism. We saw that before, didn't we? Give her the fruit of her hands. That's anathema to the socialists. It is. They hate that idea. Well, let's look at Proverbs chapter 1. The book ends, if you will. Proverbs ends with, with work. Doesn't start out that way. Listen to this. Proverbs chapter 1. Not a pretty picture we're going to paint here of human beings in their natural state. state. My son, if sinners can, um, entice you, do not consent. This is Proverbs 1.10. If they say, this is verse 11, come with us, let us wait, lay and wait to shed blood. Okay, now look, look as I read this for these vices here. Let us lay and wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. We shall all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, but they wait and they lay and wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of the owners. Do you remember the virtuous woman? She's keeping her family alive and the poor. Who are these people keeping alive? Nobody. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, they're going to kill everybody, including themselves here. Now, did you see some of these vices there? Work or war, my friends. Because if you don't want to work for goods, you're going to have to steal them some kind of way from your neighbor. That's it. There's no other way it's going to happen for you. It's just, it's like a, and did you hear that nice socialism in there? See, see, and this is one of the problems that we run into here at the Middle Atlantic Ray from Mason Society. Here's what we run into. You know what? You know what, Joe? Nice work you're doing at Mars, but uh, I just preach the gospel. You just want to preach the gospel. And so my question is, since when did the whole counsel of God become the enemy of, God, of the gospel? Uh, am I allowed to pray? Did, did you hear what I said here? Cast in your lot among us, let us all have one purse. Doesn't that sound like every socialist utopian problem you've ever heard in your life? And God condemns it. He's not neutral towards this. And we, we, we fail our congregations and our fellow believers if we just shrug our shoulders and say, well, you know, social, steal from people, whatever you want to call it. God doesn't really care. It's just your relationship with him. Well, this kind of thing defines your relationship with him. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, just, just hang out and feel good. And whatever. Come on. No. The Bible speaks to all of life. Give her the fruit of her hands. Opposite of casting your lot among us as all have one. You know, I, I, socialism just goes from war to war. That's all it does. If I have goods and I want to keep them, I'm going to, I'm going to be at war with the guy who wants to take them. We've got a soft war going on right now. It's the soft war. It's the quiet war. It's a war in your paycheck. It's a war every time you go to Walmart and you're paying all kinds of extra hidden taxes. It's a soft war against those who produce. Still remember the um, time we had in our home one time. One of those, uh, one of those moments. That's a good one. Um, if you teach your children at home, you have. I mean, you can have. A, if you don't teach your children at home, you can have teaching moments too. That's not just homeschools, but this was this was a pretty good one. My 18-year-old is was you know going out and getting a job and uh, <coughs> came back with this paycheck stuff. <laughs> Boy, work education is about to begin. <laughs> he said, "Hey, Dad, yeah, they're taking an awful lot of money out of my paycheck." Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, they are. He said, "Who's getting this money?" He thought about it. I said, people who, who don't want to work? I said, <coughs> mostly. And he just asked, you know, you and I would never ask this question. He's 18 years old, a little naive. He said, uh, why aren't they working? Because I'm working. Why aren't they working? You know, I have no answer for that, really. So I made one up. And I said, look, why should they work? 
you and I are stupid enough to go out and work our little tails off so that they can take money from us and give it to them not to work. And that's pretty much it. Am I right or right? Honestly. Really. I used to live in Reading. Saw it all the time. People just flat out didn't work. Day after day after day, see them come out and sit on the porch about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. They are at war, though, for your goods. It's a soft war. It's a legal war. But it's a war nonetheless. From an article by Eric Nideros in Military Heritage Magazine called Divine Winds Triumph, empires based on military conquest continually expand. Once the forward motion ceases, de decay and decline are almost inevitable. This is what happened to the Roman Empire, but there were traits within the Mongol culture that made perpetual conquest a necessity. A Khan's prestige also depended on his successes in defeating enemies. You know, you know the writers say, you know how the Khan stays the Khan? Keep on plundering your neighbor. And keep on finding neighbors to plunder. Why did the Soviet Union run out of gas, finally? They ran, out, they ran out of people with goods. Do you, you ever think behind the Iron Curtain one, one invention they ever came up with, honestly? I, I, I mean, talk about the shortest book in the world. Invention, in, inventions in communism. About the only thing I think of is the AK-47. And you know what happened to that guy? I didn't know this. I read it recently. They wound up putting him in jail, too. Some kind of threat he was to somebody. And he wound up in jail. That's pretty much it. An instrument of destruction. Work or war. Dean King wrote a book. It's called um, Skeletons in the Sahara. This happened back in 1815. Captain Riley and his good Yankee crew of 11 left Connecticut for an ordinary merchant voyage in 1815 and eventually found her on the west coast of the Sahara, 600 miles south of Morocco. This is 1815. Uh, um, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson are still alive. They were beset by hostile thieving nomads but briefly escaped by taking the sea in the ship's longboats. They were eager to be away from the Sahara, which everyone knew was a realm of death, but was which at that time uncharted, mysterious, and full, so the stories went of cannibals, and that was true. They ran out of provisions at sea and were forced to make for Sahara, then south of Bojador, and their prospects were just as bad. Other tribesmen captured them, took their goods, and made them slaves. And I read this book, and it was kind of an amazing book because these people in these merchant ships would trade. Now, they hated getting around Africa, though, because the Africans had nothing. And so if there was ever a shipwreck, they would plunder the, they'd plunder the ship for anything that was good and sell, the, um, and, and sell the crew as slaves. But let's ask ourselves a question. Why? Why is Africa such a disaster? Which continent has the most natural resources of all the continents? Hint, it's not Australia. It's definitely not North America. It's not Asia, it's Africa. They have the most precious metals, they have the longest growing season, and they're the poorest. How many reasons? One, in Africa you get punished if you work. They call them profiteers. I've read about it. You know, somebody works, makes a little money, wants to maybe buy another field, grow some more coffee beans, next thing you know, there's somebody coming around with a gun, I'm gonna give you some of your money. See, they're still doing it. They're still plundering. Work or war. Those are, are our options, my friends. That's it. Have you ever contemplated the setting of Christ's parables? The majority of them deal with work. In fact, it's hard to name two or three in a row that don't include that subject. You ever thought about that? Christ was all about work. Not all about work. But his parables have to do with work again and again. He told us that he came that we might have life and that more abundantly. There is no way abundant life is possible without work someone has to produce. And we, we spiritualize this a lot, you know. I am coming in life but more abundantly. That means go to heaven when we die. Does. But have you ever noticed that where Christ goes, a little bit of heaven is brought down to earth? Have you ever noticed that? Again and again. Remember reading a case by a guy who's an atheist. Professed atheists, I should say. There are no atheists. The scripture is very clear on that. They know God, they suppress the truth. No atheists.
just professing atheist. Anyway, he said he was walking across Africa, and he said, you know, and he was riding his bike. He said, I still don't believe in God, but you know what? Every time there was a mission somewhere, that's where I was staying. Because I knew it was the only place I could be safe. You see, that mission's bringing a little bit of heaven. Is it not? Down to earth. That's the history of the Christian of Christianity. Now we've got to talk about something that's near and dear to everybody's heart. Talk about working. Have you ever sat back and contemplated retirement? <laughs> you know, where you don't do any work anymore. I was really proud of my own father. He worked until he was 86. I wasn't as productive as he was. But he hated the idea of re retirement. He said, you know, he said, if I can still work, there's work to be done. Then he said, follow this really simple logic from my dad. Right? This is the simplest logic. He said, you know what? I can work. There's work to be done. Why am I not working? The logic was too simple. I just couldn't argue with it. Still can't. Now I know people slow down when we get it. But why? Why do we have to say, you know what, I've worked for how many years, now I'm not going to do anything. And, you know, now we're seeing the danger of that, are we not? You know, 25 years ago, that was a big thing to be able to do. But now we've just seen way too much heart attacks, strokes, nonsense happen to people that don't want to work anymore. We're made to work, my friends. And it's a good thing and a godly thing. Maybe someday we can do a talk on retirement. <laughs> it's, almost, it's almost heresy to attack retirement. You ever find retirement in Bible? Good luck with that one. I haven't seen it yet. If one produces, or if no one produces, then no one benefits from production. Godless cultures will, over time, be based on power, not production. They'll be based on Proverbs 1, those bad people plundering each other, rather than Proverbs 31, producing enough for one's family and enough for one's neighbor. That's it. There's, there's, no, there's no other way to, to, to found a nation. Now then, there are only two ways to gain the benefits of production, work or theft. Of these two, only Christianity is sustainable over time because it alone is completely hostile to plunder. My friends, there is no other religion that's completely hostile to plunder. None. Not one. If, it's, if, if a religion is completely hostile to plunder, then it has to be completely open to work. That's it. There's no other way for it to be, right? No other way. All other belief systems embrace plunder at some point. Some are even based on it. And of course, we talked about communism, socialism before. Based on plunder. I want to wrap things up from a... Uh, A lot of things we could have said this morning, we kind of ran out of time. This is a uh, case that I want to read to you about. About some good things that were done by some guys on a ship at one point. This is from R.J. Rush uh, reach um, Roots of Reconstruction. Hope we make the point here, final point, of the difference between work or war. Hope we get it done. The Congo is in shambles today, and the major victims are the Negroes, not because there are more evil men today, but because good men have surrendered control. Another illustration. In the 1830s, American ships began to suffer savagely at the hands of Malay pirates, or Malaysia. One incident is especially memorable. Captain Josh Stevens and his bark Aurora, or ship Aurora, from Booth Bay, Maine, were becalmed and unable to sail away from the vicinity of an island. The Malay pirates attacked repeatedly, knowing the ship to be undermanned, and finally all but four men were killed. These four men, all wounded, escaped in the longboat, led by the second mate, whose name was Avery. Their only supply was a small store of water and dry biscuits. They could have rowed to a friendly island 500 miles away. They chose instead to make for the Pole Star, 
from Rockport, Maine, under Captain Hen Crosley, a hundred miles away, and no doubt becalmed like themselves. So they knew he wasn't moving. So they, but they could move in their, in their boat. They were rowing. With only the briefest pauses, never wasting time for speaking, the men rowed night and day until they reached the Pole Star. Captain Crosley immediately sent men by longboat to Captain Edwards of the Emerald, a third ship, of New Bedford, and Captain Nye of the Southern Cross, a fourth ship, sent 14 men, and the Emerald sent 10 men to give a total of over 50 with extra weapons also loaned. The Pole Star sailed to Parang, where Crosley, pretending that his ship was disabled, Parang was where they attacked the first time. He pretended that his ship was uh, di disabled, began repairs, keeping most of his men hidden and his weapons concealed. The Malay pirates poured out in great numbers, happy to have another Yankee ship to loot. Climax is dramatically recounted by A. Hyatt Verrill in his book, Perfumes and Spices, including a count of soaps and cosmetics. Okay, this is, this is what happened. Worker war. Onward came the Malays. Once again, a helpless vessel was at their mercy. Once more, they felt sure they could satiate their lust for white man's blood and white men's rum, and confident of victory, they dashed alongside the Pole Star, le leaped from their, their canoes with savage yells, and swarmed up the ship's sides. Not until the natives' heads appeared above the rails did Captain Crossley give the world word to his impatient men. Then with lusty shouts and curses, the 53 whalemen sprang up. With blazing muskets and pistols, with deadly spades and heavy lances, they and the merchant seamen fell upon the utterly astounded melees. Turbaned heads were sliced from shoulders by their blubber blades. Heavy lances were plunged through naked bodies by arms that had driven the weapons to the hearts of sperm whales. Broad axes cut through limbs and skulls, and shot and bullets mowed down scores of the savages. Not a melee lived to set foot upon the Pole Star's decks. Not one who had attempted to board the ship remained uninjured to drop back to the canoes. Dozens, terrified, utterly demoralized, thinking only to escape the fearsome weapons and demoniacal, de demoniacal fury of the white men, <clears throat> flung themselves into the sea, where they were instantly torn to pieces by the ravenous sharks, attracted by the scene, by the blood that flowed in crimson streams from the ship's scuppers. And when the occupants of the last two boats saw the awful carnage and heard the terror-stricken yells of their fellows and hastily tried to turn back, Captain Hen trained his single cast-iron cannon upon them and sent a deadly hail of nails, bolts, screws, links of chain, and other junk into them with terrible effectiveness. Not a single melee ever reached the shore alive. Within 10 minutes, the battle was over. Without the loss of a man, the Yankees had completely annihilated the natives and had exacted a terrible vengeance for the murder of Captain Stevens and his crew. As the yards were swung and the pole star headed to the open sea, Captain Crosley gazed with grim satisfaction upon the carnage he had wrought. Spinning reflectively to, up to leeward, he glanced at the receding bulk of the island, at the drifting shattered corpse-filled canoes, at the sharp black fins cutting through the surface of the bloodstained water. I calculate that what we might call a good deed well done, he remarked to Mr. Avery. Darned if I did not say I learned him a lesson, and by glory I reckon I'd done so. He had. For years after, no Yankee ship was ever again attacked by the natives of Parang. The mere sight of a weather-beaten, lofty sparred ship would send them in terror to the jungle lairs, and for generations the islanders spoke in all tones of the white devils who had avenged their slain countrymen. End of story. Is there any other way? <coughs> you see, we don't have those kind of fights going on. We have, we have the soft war going on, don't we? But is there any other way? There is no other way. It's work or it's war. Could those natives have worked, instead of plundering, could they have worked to trade? Sure they could have. But they'd rather plunder. <laughs>